let us worship the Lord who has made us one in spirit and purpose, celebrating the peace that Christ himself has brought us. And this is In The Moment. I'm your host, Reverend Ricky Allen Jr. Thanking you as always for joining us on this lovely day the Lord has made. And of course, wherever you are, wherever you're doing, I just pray that the Lord Jesus Christ is leading you as we continue our trek through 2024. Hope you're staying safe out there. Hope you're enjoying this breaking weather that we're having. I know in Pennsylvania, we've had a, a little bit of a warm spell coming. So I hope you're enjoying your weather wherever you are. And I hope you're out there doing the Lord's work as always. Let us get started. So our morning scripture reading is from Galatians 3.28. Galatians 3.28, which reads, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And that especially hits different as we are in February, which you know is Black History Month, recognizing the achievements of of a community that began in one place but ended up in another. We just thank God for that. We thank God for all of our ancestors who came before us who were able to contribute in a variety of ways to this country that we live in right now. Do you realize that probably there's an invention out there that you're using that more than likely African-American hands made? And so we thank God for their contributions. We thank God for his delivery of a people who came here in chains. And we thank God for everybody coming together continuously to make things happen, regardless of the time, regardless of the generation. They came together, regardless of their circumstances, and still contributed and made it happen. Words that we probably should need right now as we move forward in a society that feels more divided than ever before. Nonetheless though, God is still on the throne. He sees what's going on and he is going to respond if he isn't already. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today humbled and grateful for your gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who has torn down the walls of hostility that once separated us. In him, you have created a new humanity, united in love, peace, and purpose. As we gather to worship you, help us to embody the unity and reconciliation that Christ has achieved. Teach us to look beyond our differences, seeing each other through your eyes as we love children of your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for the diversity within the body of believers. Help us to celebrate our differences as a reflection of your creativity and love. Guide us in the building of a community that mirrors the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. May we be a beacon of hope and reconciliation in a world marked by division and strife. As we reflect on your word today, open our hearts and transform us inside out with your love. Empower us to be architects of peace in our homes, workplaces, and communities. Following the example of Jesus Christ, May the words of Galatians 3.28 resonate deeply within us, Lord, reminding us that in Christ we are all one, no longer divided by the distinctions of this world, but united in our identity as your children. Bless us at this moment, Lord. Someone somewhere is stressing out about something. Someone somewhere is trying to make the bills work, trying to put food on the table, trying to worry about the things that you have called us to concern ourselves with. But you told us, don't worry, because you're going to provide for us. Remind them of your words, Lord. Someone's overseas fighting for this country, thinking about a family who's been left back home. Someone right now is behind bars, reflecting on their behaviors. Help them see what they need to see, Lord. Encourage them in their respective scenarios and remind them that you are the reason we all get up to see another day. Help us be mindful of the time we have, help us redeem it properly, and help us share this hope that we have in you. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, amen. Our topic today is the peacemaking power of the cross the peacemaking power of the cross and we're going to ephesians 2 14 through 18 which reads 
For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create himself in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you, who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Let us pray. Now, Lord, help us understand this unity in times of division and strife. Help us apply the unifying power of Jesus Christ to our communities, maybe even in our homes, in our friendships. And we will forever give your name the glory and the praise, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. We live in a world where some have made race their religion. It's what they worship, is what they wake up to, it's what they talk about, it's their God, lowercase g. In response, churches around our lovely country have isolated themselves from these conversations or embrace more than they should have, or have combated it the wrong way and have closed their doors, locked them with chains. While God made us like snowflakes, unique in every way, and while we do have a desire to celebrate our differences and highlight our contributions, it cannot never, ever, 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 <laughs> it's poor English, I know, surpass the cross of Christ. Regardless of where you are on the spectrum of race and diversity, it cannot rival or be erected in front of the cross of Christ. The redemptive work of Jesus is the only way to heaven. And to think there's another way is a fool's journey on a, in a circle that goes nowhere forever other than round and round. The problem is we've moved from a country that was divided by skin types and culture to a country that is making money from the one thing that divides us, racism. Look at your media, look at your entertainment, look at everything you read from inside the schools to outside the schools. They're making money off of it now. Satan has once again tricked us into dividing ourselves for the sake of the love of money and clout. When the George Floyd protest was going on, I had a friend who contacted me and he was talking about how he was praying for change. And I said, okay, well I am too, thank you. And I asked him, how are you doing? I got no response. A couple of days later I contacted him and said, hey, is everything going good? I haven't heard from you since the last time we talked and got no response. Now guarantee this is the, this, that comment about praying for change was the first time I had heard from this guy in about 10 years. And so I thought that maybe this incident would have sparked a new conversation between us and it did not only to realize that oh maybe he felt some kind of guilt and felt some time felt some time of type of way and reached out to the one brother that he knew and that was about it so i unfriended him and i explained to him why i was unfriending him and he never responded to this day and i pray that his heart changes i pray that that he hears the word through what happened. When it comes to this issue in America, as we celebrate Black History Month in February, we shine a light on this brighter than ever and reveal there's still more work to be done here on earth. And it begins with pointing people to the cross of Christ. In Ephesians 2, 14 through 18, the Apostle Paul unveils this radical nature of the work of Jesus, a work that transcends more religious, mere religious observance, piercing directly into the core of our shared humanity. This passage offers us not just theological insights, but a divine blueprint for how we are to live in this world together. A world so often fractured by divisions, whether they be racial, social, or cultural. Riots have been had over them. Wars have been fought over them as well. But what do we get from this? What, uh, what is the peacemaking power 
of the cross. Well, the first thing it is, it is a wall destroyer. The peacemaking power of the cross is a wall destroyer. Paul portrays Christ as the ultimate peacemaker, a figure whose actions transcend mere mortal endeavors, bridging the vast chasm of division between Jews and Gentiles. The scripture does not just talk about reconciliation. It visualizes the demolition of an immense barrier, both literal and figurative, that had been there for centuries, delineated by the chosen from the outsiders, the pure from the impure. Now, when I say Christ is a wall destroyer, it's not merely about the physical tearing down of walls, but rather the obliteration of the hostility that these walls represent. It's about dissolving the deep-seated prejudices, the entrenched beliefs that segregate human from human, brother from brother. And we see these things still to this day. Stronger in some parts of the world than others, but yet it still exists. Paul's narrative does more than recount a historical event. It issues a call to action for the modern church and society at large. In a world filled with division, be it racial, ethnic, social, economic, or cultural, this portrayal of Jesus challenges us to reflect on our own roles as barrier builders or breakers, especially in the church. If you're out there right now, you still describing your church as a white church or as a black church, then you are slightly part of the problem. There's nothing wrong with giving an idea of who's going there if you must give a demo any at all. If that's still a criteria for you, you, you're, you might be part of the problem. If we're still there, we got to get away from it. It compels us to ask ourselves hard questions about the walls we erect around our hearts and communities. The imagery is powerful. I get it. Urging us to dismantle the constructs of discrimination and inequality that persists, not with physical tools, but through love, understanding, and the embrace of our shared humanity, but not without the call to repentance. I want to make that very clear. When we hear these words in the media, and when we hear these words in society, you never hear about the call to repentance, the call to come to the cross of Jesus Christ. They only say, just come belong. We love you regardless. Just come along. You belong. It's okay. Regardless of how you're living, regardless of what you're doing, it's okay. Just come along. No, it's not. You need to repent. You need to repent. You need to repent. I can't say it enough. We want everybody to come. We also want you to recognize the transforming power of Jesus Christ at the cross where my Savior died. But we have to have the love, speaking truth to love. We have to give the understanding and yes, embrace this shared humanity that we're in, not without sharing the good news, though. In other words, for those who think they can do it any other way, to be racist is against God's word. Because there is no way you can live out the Great Commission and be picky on who you're going to disciple when God can send you anyone. A lot of y'all out there right now are dying to be used by the Lord. You have a zeal to be serving in the kingdom of God, but you got criteria. You got these policies. You got these rules in which you will do it. And you're expecting God to break through all those things to get to you to serve him. No, he waits at the gates. He waits for you to repent from your hardened heart, from your fear, from your scared heart, to tear down all those walls and say, here I am, Lord, use me. Regardless of where it's at, regardless of what I'm doing, just use me. So many of us want to serve the kingdom and are not available because of what's going on in this old heart. The passage serves as a reminder that the mission of reconciliation is ongoing. This is a living, breathing imperative that echoes through the ages, calling us for a relentless pursuit of peace and unity. It is a testament to the transforming power of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which not only reconciled humanity to God, but also set a precedent for overcoming the divisions that fragment our world to this day. 
As followers of Jesus, we are invited to partake in this mission, to be agents of change, drawing on his word and his word alone. The Bible is and will always be enough. You don't have to change the gospel. You don't have to create another gospel to reach people. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good enough. It is sufficient. It can be trusted. You can depend on it. And if you can't do that, the problem is you and your heart and all the criteria you have to serve in the kingdom. The peacemaking power of the cross is also the new humanity architect. Verse 15 further unfolds the narrative of reconciliation presenting Christ as the architect of a new humanity. This verse is very important, revealing the intention behind Christ's sacrificial act. It wasn't merely to absolve sin, but to forge something unprecedented. A unifying body tra transcending the ancient ordinances that have been long governed by purity and belonging. By nullifying the Jewish law with these commands and regulations, Christ laid the foundation for a community defined not by lineage or legal adherence, but by faith and love. The imagery of Jesus as this new humanity architect is rich with the implications for the day's world, where divisions along the lines of race ethnicity and culture remain deeply ingrained. We've got churches right now that probably should be planted in certain places, but everybody's more worried about if it's going to be a white church or a black church than simply a church where God is worshipped. This verse challenges these divisions, offering the blueprint for a society that values diversity not as a barrier, but as a bridge. It prompts radical rethinking of community and identity, suggesting the essence of belonging lies not in our external markers, but in our shared faith in Jesus Christ. The vision is revolutionary. It always has been. Advocating for a community that transcends conventional boundaries. It speaks to this truth that in God's eyes there are no foreigners or strangers, only fellow citizens of the kingdom. The perspective is poignant in our contemporary discussions on immigration, racial equality, and social justice. It encourages us to look beyond the superficial differences that separate us to recognize and celebrate the intrinsic value of every individual as part of this new humanity, saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, S growing stronger as we come in confession and repentance to be transformed by the Holy Spirit, to become this new creature, no longer leaning to the powers of the world, but only to the power of God through Jesus Christ. This verse serves as a challenge to the church to lead by example, to embody the vision of unity and including those who have an ear to hear the word of the Lord. It calls for a reevaluation of our practices and our prejudices, urging us to build not walls, but bridges. The concept of a new humanity designed by Jesus is not just a theological ideal. It is a practical blueprint for how we ought to live together, embracing our differences and finding our commonality in the love of Christ. It is a call to action, urging us to work tirelessly towards the realization of this divine architecture in our communities and in our hearts. And then there's verse 16 where it shows us the peacemaking power of the cross is a peace broker. In verse 16, Paul depicts Christ's crucifixion as a monumental event that reconciled both Jews and Gentiles to God in one body, therefore putting to death the hostility that had divided them. The imagery of Christ as the ultimate peace broker highlights his role not just in the spiritual realm, but in the very tangible reality of human relationships. The cross in this context, becomes more than a symbol of salvation and embodies the ultimate act of peacemaking, a divine intervention that eradicated the enmity which had festered for centuries between distinct groups of people. Do you know that Jesus Christ is a peace broker today? Are you aware of that? This verse prompts a deep reflection on the nature of reconciliation and peace. And it's not through protest, it's not through yelling and screaming and destroying stuff. It's not through standing by and letting wrong be wrong either. You cannot serve God that way and think that 
you're a Christian. It suggests that true peace is not merely the absence of conflict. We know there will be conflict out here in this world, but the presence of justice, unity, and mutual understanding. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross is presented as the epitome of sacrificial love and forgiveness. Principles that are essential in overcoming division and hostility, regardless of the experience, regardless of what happened during that time and what was going on in your, in your era, regardless of how old you are and where you see this whole thing, whatever vantage point it is, I'm going to say it again. Christ sacrifice is presented as the epitome of sacrificial love and forgiveness principles that are essential in overcoming division and unit and hostility in today's society where conflict arises from differences in ideology and race and we can say it over and over again this message is especially pertinent it challenges us to consider our roles in perpetuating division or fostering peace which side are you on the day which side is your heart on the day and are you out there calling yourself a Christian, a follower of Christ, advocating these sides? I'm not saying don't identify the problem. We should identify the problem. As long as there is a problem, it should be identified. But where do we hold the accountability? I say to the cross. Point to the cross or they remain lost. The depiction of Christ as a peace broker extends our invitation to emulate his example in our daily lives. It calls for active engagement in peacemaking efforts, whether in personal relationships, within communities, or across societal divides. This verse serves as a reminder that the impact of sacrificial love and forgiveness can have in healing wounds and building bridges between estranged groups. It encourages us to move beyond tolerance towards a deeper, more encompassing peace that heals and unites. You're not just dealing with it, you're engaging it. It also has implications for how we address the contemporary issues of social justice and reconciliation. It underscores the need for approach that not only addresses the symptoms of the vision, but tackles the underlying causes by looking to the example of Jesus. We can see inspiration for creative and compassionate solutions that address the root causes of injustice and inequality. And the work continues. And then we see verse 17, the peacemaker, the peacemaking power of the cross is the messenger of peace. It expands upon the themes of reconciliation in verse 17, presenting Christ as the messenger of peace to those both far and away and those near. It underscores where Christ includes everybody, highlighting this universal appeal and accessibility. The distinction between those far and near transcends geographical distances, touching on the spiritual separation that existed between the Gentiles, the far, and the Jews, the near. Christ's proclamation of peace bridges this divide, offering hope and redemption to all, irrespective of their prior standing. His role as the messenger of peace challenges us to extend the boundaries of our empathy and our concern, reaching out to those beyond our immediate circles. It prompts us to question the barriers we erect, whether consciously or unconsciously, that prevents us from fully embracing and sharing the peace of Christ with others. Do you have those boundaries in your life right now? And you're wondering why you're not effective in your ministry or wondering why you, you just, you don't know where to begin. It begins with you recognizing that you are a sinner that needs saving if you really want to contribute to the kingdom. You cannot do this without Jesus Christ. You cannot love at this level without Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you that right now. You may not want to hear it. You might think, I can do this without God. I can do this without the church. That might be true to a certain degree. And when I say a certain degree, I mean you will have a limit before you break. Your power will run out because you're depending on you and your emotions will take over and you're going to quit. You're going to quit because you cannot do this. You cannot love this way without Jesus Christ. What this offers is a counter narrative to the voices that advocate for isolation and division and thinking that that's a better way. They're thinking they've tried the integration. It's not really working. People are offending each other. Let's just go back to being separate. That's what Satan wants though. 
but this but this but the scriptures though they remind us of the transforming power of the love of Jesus Christ we're called to be ambassadors of this peace embodying and sharing with the world in desperate need of reconciliation and healing. And we can see it in the news, in our social media, uh, in our music, we can see it everywhere. And then there is the peacemaking power of the cross being the uniter of humanity. Ephesians 2.18 culminates the discussion of this reconciliation, affirming that through Christ, both Jews and Gentiles have access to the Father by one spirit. This verse celebrates the unity and equality that Christ's sacrifice has achieved, emphasizing that the access to God is no longer mediated by ethnicity, cultural background, or social status. It proclaims this powerful truth. In God's family, there are no second-class citizens. All are equally beloved, equally valued, and equally welcomed. The message of unity is foundational to understanding the Christian faith and its implications for how we interact with one another. It confronts the human tendency to categorize and exclude, offering instead a vision of community that is built on Jesus Christ, which gives, gives us the byproducts of respect, love, and the recognition of our common humanity. In a world marked by division and disparity, this vision is not only refreshing, but revolutionary. For many people, this is the shocking truth about us. We talked about that a few weeks ago. They don't get this part because they're still thinking on their own power. We are filled with the Holy Ghost, a supernatural connection through the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're going to move in a way that they're not going to ever understand. But we're going to get them there, though. It challenges us to live out our faith in ways that bridges gaps, heals divisions, and fosters a sense of belonging for all. By emphasizing that access to God, by, and by extension, the community of believers is open to everyone. The scripture here compels us to com reflect on our own practices and attitudes. Are we building communities that reflect the unity of the Spirit of the Lord? Are our churches and social circles places where diversity is celebrated as a reflection of God's kingdom, not just of the culture alone? Because we're called to a higher standard of living, people. Whether you want to believe that or not, we're called to it. And relating to one another in a way that gives God the glory for great things he has done, is doing, and will do. God's word challenges us to embody the unifying mission of Christ, breaking down the walls of the vision, building bridges of understanding, and fostering communities where peace and unity will prevail. And maybe you're out there right now. Maybe you're out there right now, and you've been wondering what's been wrong in your community. Maybe you've been wondering what's been wrong in your home and your relationship. You're not unified by the blood of the Lamb. And right now, I need you to recognize that, that you need Jesus Christ in your life as the, to be the Lord of your life. I need you to recognize you cannot do this by yourself. You've got great zeal for serving the community. I respect that. You've got a great passion for helping others. I respect that. But are you doing it with the power of the cross? The peacemaking power of the cross. Let us heed this call right now. Let us really think about what we're doing and how we're doing it as a people, as a community of believers, not just as a black people or a white people or as a Hispanic people or as an Asian people or regardless of nationalities. This right here is what Jesus was doing to solve the problems that we have right now. We have these problems right now. Everybody thinks something about someone else and it does not give God the glory. Here's the deal. If you're looking for change in your community, if you're looking for change in the culture, in whatever culture you're a part of, is Christ first or is he supported by the adjective of your culture? Are you a black Christian or are you Christian? Are you a white Christian or are you Christian? Are you a Spanish or Japanese Christian or are you Christian? Because whatever you put in front of it, you will serve. I myself, I'm a Christian and so happens to be African American part of a rich community who has done great things, who have come from under great challenges and are still working to overcome some of those challenges. 
but I'm a Christian first. I believe in the transforming power of Jesus Christ. And I believe he can take down any racism that may be out there in front of me. So until next time, may God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. And pray for me as I pray for you. You take care.